How do you inspire and motivate and lead a group of people? How do you send a group of people on a mission that you know many of them won't return from and still get their buy-in? These are leadership questions that almost every single leader asks themselves, or at least they should if they are a leader worth their salt. And these are exactly what we talk about today with my guest, Jimmy Blackman. He's an awesome, awesome guest. Jimmy is among the most combat experienced leaders of the modern era. He's led high-risk missions all over the world, including serving as the air mission commander on operation that netted number two and number three in the famous Iraqi deck of cards. Amazingly, Jimmy also served as the aviation commander during the battles in which four medals of honor were earned in Afghanistan in the very valleys which were, the, which, uh, were where the attacks of 9-11 were planned and rehearsed. Uh, he has developed amazing skills of leadership, and today he's the managing partner at Exactus Advisors, a Chicago-based consulting firm where he travels the world speaking about leadership, organizational culture, and navigating the complexities of the 21st century. He is Army Ranger qualified, as well as Airborne qualified, uh, and actually he is a, an IBO world champion in archery. Uh, I wish we would have been able to talk about that a little bit today, but... Uh, anyways, we have an awesome conversation with Jimmy lined up. Uh, before we get to that, a couple of announcements. First of all, make sure you guys go to audibletrial.com slash theheartthingpodcast. There you can get a free audiobook right off the bat, as well as start a free 30-day trial where you can get other audiobooks at a discount. And uh, it, it goes amazingly far in helping you learn better skills because you can have people like Jimmy in your ears while you're going to work, while you're doing the dishes, while you're mowing the lawn, while you're working out. It, it is not effortless, but it definitely cuts down on some of the effort, makes it a little bit easier, and in my opinion, a little bit more enjoyable rather than reading a book, uh, which I still love, but audiobook is a lot easier to digest and consume. So go to audibletrial.com slash the hard thing podcast and never be bored on a subway train while you're going to work. Uh, second announcement, make sure you guys go to ourrescue.org and get involved with my favorite nonprofit organization, Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, imagine a world where there are no lost children. Well, that's what this organization is trying to do. They're trying to create a world where children aren't stolen to, to be sold into sex slavery. They're trying to create a world where people can feel protected. And that is happening by going undercover, getting the bad guys, putting them behind bars using evidence and natural uh, and, and using the law of the land, and then taking these kids and putting them in aftercare homes where they have a better future. So again, go to OURrescue.org, get involved. But without further ado, let's hop into today's show because as always, guys, today we're doing hard things and we're overcoming average. Well, thank you for coming on the Hard Thing Podcast, Jimmy. I'm excited to have you here and, and talk to you today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, let's dive right in with a question that I ask every single guest, Jimmy. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? Hmm. So there, you know, you, you have to divide that up. There's physical, psychological, um, there's a lot of pieces to that. And I've had a I've had a very different life. Um, the hardest physical thing I've ever done is uh, United States Army Ranger School. Um, the hardest thing I've truly ever had to do was send people on missions that I didn't think they'd come back from. Um, in my book, Pale Horse, there's a, there's a, a big piece there about sending people into the Ganjagal Valley and Eastern Afghanistan, and um, they didn't want to go. The, 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 the crews knew that the likelihood of being shot down was high, that they could die, and yet it had to be done. 18,000-foot um, ridgeline on one side, 14,000 on the other, one way in and one way out. The enemy was everywhere, and and I knew these guys. This wasn't a Vietnam, not to detract from that, but but a but a you know a. This was an all volunteer force. I knew all of these guys, and we had to go in, and I knew the likelihood of getting shot down or killed was high, but it had to be done, and I had to make that call, and I sent them in, and 
Um, on the first night after the battle at Keating, which is now kind of famous from the movie The Outpost and Jake Tapper's book, uh, um, we had to close the combat outpost of Lowell, Lowell and uh, on a, about the third turn in, the aircraft was shot with an RPG, uh, crash landed, and, and Carlos Hernandez had his leg shot off. And uh, this is a kid whose mother, you know, when talk about immigration, man, I mean, I know these people, you know, and um, when he was, when he was just an infant, his mother moved from Mexico into the United States. She ran the border with that baby on her hip and she got into the United States into Southern California and Carlos Hernandez was able to, to grow up in the United States. When he turned 17, he enlisted in the United States army and didn't even have us citizenship on in May of 2009 in Afghanistan at Bagram Air Base, he swore allegiance to the United States and got his citizenship. And that fall, I sent him into a valley in which he got his leg shot off. And um, those calls were the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, he lived and he's in a good place now. Um, some didn't. Those were the hardest days of my life. Obviously, that's a very sobering topic um and and hopefully i can touch on it with uh, as much delicacy as is needed the question that kind of comes to mind the most is how do you choose who goes in in situations like that who who do you send yeah so <clears throat> you know you don't have unlimited assets you've got so many and everyone's on a rotation whether they're running day shifts or night shifts and so it's really just who's up it isn't a conscious picking individuals it's okay who's who's the cruise tonight here's the mission sets we have who best fits the mission set whether that's moving people and equipment to Bagram from uh, Jalalabad, which is where I was at, or that's going to break down an outpost in, you know, the, the Camdesh River Valley. Um, it's, um, it, it's kind of really who's up on what shift. You try to, you try to match the crews up the best you can, uh, you know, based on individuals, but uh, it kind of is a function of who's on what shift. Um, so I guess the, the flip side of that is <clears throat> how do you, and, and this goes in large for leaders of any kind, not just in the military or, or people dealing in life and death situations. How do you as a leader kind of live with the decisions you make, even ones that aren't necessarily mistakes, but are definitely have consequences? Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to make the best decision you can with the information you have at the time and, and know that you did the best you could. And, and I, I feel like um, that's all I ever ask. I never, you know, I never played the political side. Um, I never asked myself, what will my boss think or, or what might they, you know, he or she think. It was what's the right thing to do, given the information I have and the situation we're in. That meant that Jimmy Blackman sometimes blew off some policies, some regulations. Um, I had good bosses and they wouldn't mind me. I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, Major General Jeff Slosher, Major General uh, Scaparotti, those commanding generals knew Jimmy Blackman and they knew I was pushing the envelope and they would tell you that. Um, I was blowing off some policies that we had there because I thought that it was the right thing to do, given the information I had in the situation we were in. I would have preferred that the policies be changed, but they weren't. And, and what I asked myself every day was for the rest of my life, can I look in a mirror to shave my face or not <laughs> and say, you did the right thing for the right reasons. And if, and if I couldn't look in the mirror and do it, I couldn't live with myself. And I didn't want that to ever be the case. I didn't ever want that to be what I had to live with. And so I said, you know, if this means the end of my career, because I screw it up one day, making the wrong call, blowing off the wrong policy, I can live with that. But I don't want to ever stand at a memorial service 
saying I made that call and my gut told me it was wrong, but I did it because of politics or what my boss would think. I, I couldn't live with that. I couldn't. Interesting. So it sounds like kind of a, a, a good mix of trusting yourself, giving yourself some grace, understanding that you're going to get some things wrong, and then also having uh, maybe a combination of the right people around you who, when you do make certain mistakes, can kind of uh, call you out or maybe kind of point you in the right direction. It sounds so like. that's a huge point. I, I always, throughout my career, tried to surround my pe- myself with people who would tell me what I needed to hear, not what I necessarily wanted to hear. And I, I had a, a, a really powerful moment with that. I was getting ready to go back to Afghanistan as a full colonel, brigade commander in the 101st Airborne Division in 2014. And my COO, my, my operations officer, uh, that, that position was open and I was, who is the right person? And I knew who I wanted, but he had done a JCS, a Joint Chiefs of Staff internship. Um, he had gone to Georgetown, got a master's, was working for um, uh, the Secretary of Defense as a junior military assistant. And I requested that he get released early to come be my COO because he was that guy. He was a New Jersey native smoking <laughs> Joe McCarthy. And uh, he was that guy that would go, do you really want to do this? I, I mean, okay, but here's what it means. Not, yes, boss, we'll do that. You know, it would be like, have you lost your mind? And, and I needed that. Uh, I needed someone who would, who would tell, you know, the proverbial The king needs to know when he's naked. Someone needs to tell him, (laughs) hey, you're you're, you're out to lunch here. You need to think about what this means. The second and third order effects of your decisions. It's funny that you mentioned that I actually had a friend uh, call me today and we had kind of a a deeper discussion. But in, in the midst of that discussion, he mentioned, yeah, we had this, a similar discussion you know, earlier this year, and, and you mentioned something that it looks like now you've gone back on. So tell me a little bit about that. And he was kind of holding my feet to the fire. And it, uh, I, I can I can vouch for that. It's really nice to have someone who supports you, but also uh, is willing to tell you what you need to hear. Uh, yeah. And I think I, I think one of the best things to do is find people who care enough about you to cause you pain. So that way, when people who don't care about you try to cause you pain, you can either deal with it or protect yourself from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So so, um, going back, let's actually talk about the Ranger School, which you mentioned. Um, Not not many people choose to join the military, unfortunately, and even less are capable enough to make it through Ranger School. So, So what started you on this long journey? So I went to North Georgia College in Nalonega, Georgia. There are four full military um, schools in the country, aside from the academies, and that's Norwich, VMI, the Citadel, and North Georgia, that you have to be in the court to go. And in North Georgia, you know, if I didn't go to Ranger School, I could have never gone back to an alumni gathering. <laughs> I'd have been shamed. <laughs> so uh, Mountain Phase of Ranger School is right there you know, within 15 miles of the, the, the campus and um, mostly uh, special forces and, you know, infantry guys that run the program. And I was the Corps commander my senior year of the Corps cadets. And so uh, while I branched aviation, not infantry, and went into the, the Air Cavalry, um, you know, Ranger School was one of those things you just did. Uh, kind of a rite of passage and, you know, the, 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 the world's most demanding leadership course that there is. And it's meant to replicate as, as closely as possible combat. I will tell you, having served six tours, <laughs> that, uh, that Ranger School was worse than any time I was in combat. <laughs> no one died um, and, and no one got shot, but the misery was was much more demanding in, in ranger school than combat. That's interesting. The thing that kind of stuck out to me the most, uh, and I, I'd never heard this before, but you said it is the the most challenging leadership course. Yeah. Being a lay person, uninitiated, um, I always thought, you know, ranger school, you, you learn how to 
do all the crazy cool things that are in Hollywood, which is obviously a farce, but um, I never really thought about it being a leadership course. Can you tell us a little bit more about how they kind of develop your leadership leadership skills within the course? Yeah, so so the the whole thesis of my book is before you can lead others, you must first learn to, to lead yourself. So what can I do? What am I capable of under duress, under stress? So Ranger School, uh, back when I went, had desert phase. So it was it was 58 days um, and in all environments, one meal a day, one meal ready to eat per day. Uh, I went in at 185 pounds. I graduated 58 days later at 158 pounds. Wow. Um, sleep two to two to two and a half, three hours a night max. Um, and so, you know, just, I mean, incredibly physically challenging and in desert and swamp and mountains and city. And you learn a lot about yourself. What can you handle? What can you go through? But along the way, you're put into leadership positions of which you get graded and you have to motivate and lead your peers to accomplish a mission when they are the tiredest they've ever been in their lives, the hungriest they've ever been in their lives. And but yet you've got to get them to accomplish something. And so it is a leadership school. How do you bring people together to accomplish a mission in the most miserable, challenging state of life you've ever been in? I love that. Before you can lead others, you must learn to lead yourself. I think that is pivotal. And I, I think your answer to this next question really kind of ties into that and keys up on exactly how you lead yourself. Most people obviously you're not most people because most people would quit in such circumstances. So what kept you going? So uh, obviously I, so for me in the book, I mentioned that I, I, you know, I really wanted the Ranger tab, but then I, I would picture that guy. And I talk about that guy <laughs> that had a Ranger tab that I thought was weak, that I was not impressed by. And I thought, if that guy can do it, can't you? <laughs> I mean, he got his, he obviously did what he needed to do. So don't quit. You know, everyone that goes through ranger school comes upon that moment where they want to quit. And I share that in my book that, you know, the, the point where I was like, I'm done, I'm quitting. And, and I didn't obviously, but so for, for me, it was also this lead yourself, learn to lead yourself before you can lead others. I knew that others would need me and I would need them. Well, if, if I would need them, what would I want of them when I was in charge? And so if I expect others to follow me, if I expect others to be able to perform despite the misery for me to get me a passing grade on my patrol, wouldn't I give that back to them? Wouldn't I do that for my teammate? So what kind of team player are you? What kind of teammate are you? That's really I, I ask myself that every day. And it might, I, you know, I don't want them to look at me and go, Blackman, when he's in charge, he expects everyone to follow, but you know, he sure didn't help me on my patrol. Man, that's a heck of a thing to live with. The, that's a really fascinating way to look at leadership. It, it's a, the way you describe it, it's a very reciprocal uh, yeah. experience, which um, I, I think is very counterintuitive for, for how most people think about being a leader. And I think maybe we, we watch too much TV and we have all these ideas of, you know, uh, like, uh, I don't know, kings, queens, all, all these fantastical figures uh, leading from the back. Uh, but the way you describe it, it, it sounds kind of like you described earlier, it's a rotation. Sometimes you're leading, sometimes you're following. And and sometimes, I guess, I don't, there's probably not any in between. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, so it's funny. When I grew up in the Cold War, it was more of a command and control type of environment, right? And I remember being taught it's lonely at the top. <laughs> you got to isolate yourself as a leader, you know? Mm -hmm. And my, I, I never got that. So if it's lonely at the top, you're not leading, you're mountain climbing, <laughs> right? Leading's here, man. It's it's us. It, it, 
it, there is no I, me, and my. It's we, us, and ours. I love that. I love that. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to kind of point back to as well, you said during the course, uh, Ranger course, <clears throat> you had to learn how to motivate and lead your team. And it struck me as fascinating that you didn't kind of lump those two together. There, there are two separate actions, motivate and lead. Uh, how would you kind of define each? Yeah. So in a very visceral way, leading is putting the plan together for accomplishing the mission and briefing that, helping to make sure that everyone understands their significant contribution and part of that mission, right? So the, the technical capability to put a plan together, a tactical plan to accomplish a mission, expressing that, articulating that to everyone in a way they can understand it and out, you know, laying out your expectations, but then motivating, I mean, Look, there were nights where I grabbed a guy by the face, right, like by the cheeks, and pulled him in and said, "Brother, I need you. I, I need you to. I need you to shake off the sleep. I need you to suck it up, and I need you to perform because I got to get a go. I'm here for you. Are you here for me? Nose to nose at two o'clock in the morning when it's five degrees outside and the suck is through the roof, and and a guy." responds to that he looks at you and goes yeah i'm gonna need you in a night or two as well and and, and i'll get myself together that, that's a you know that's it's almost a primitive type of thing you know at the end of the day we're we still have a lot of primitive dna in us it's you know it, it really is people people want to be led they want to be inspired we all do no matter how old we are, we're at, like, I'll be 53 years old in a month. And I look around, I want to be led. I want to be inspired. I want my leaders to, I want to look to them and go, that's my leader. That's my boss, you know? Yeah. Obviously, in situations like that, things are maybe a little bit more extreme than the average desk job, right? Um, so what thoughts do you have about Kind of taking those same principles and putting it in in the situation of <clears throat> maybe a corporate office or a home business or something where where you're not necessarily awake at five in the clock in the morning when it's really really cold outside and you haven't eaten since like seven hours. Yeah, ago. no, good question. I so I'm a consultant now. I, I I'm a you know I own a consulting firm. I'm a managing partner in a consulting firm. There's four of us, and our our clients are primarily Fortune 500 companies. A lot of white collar folks, right? And they still respond to those same things. They want to be coached. They want to be led. They want to be inspired. I think it's in our DNA. And so when I can come in and fire them up and be like, you know, do you want a J-O-B for a paycheck? Or do you want to come in every day and go, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to leave a legacy. What do you want to do? Who are you? Right? Mm -hmm. Go home and look in the mirror. Are you just that dude that collects a paycheck every week? Or are you going to make this company better? Are you going to be a part of something that, that, that makes a difference that move the needle or are you just that guy treading water? I mean, man, live with yourself. How does that feel? Like yeah. crap, right? <laughs> yeah. I, people respond. They do. I love that. Um, I, in my experience, the best leaders I've had have always been, um, they've always had some sort of extra amount of energy that normal people didn't really seem to have. Um, have you found that to be the case or, or is that just another skill that, uh, leaders kind of, so, know? yeah, so it's interesting that you ask that because when I was a brigade commander, a, a colonel in the 101st Airborne Division, I had five, uh, battalion commanders, lieutenant colonels that commanded for me, very different personalities and two of them, very extreme different ends of the spectrum. One a basketball player from West Point, six foot five, bigger than life guy, big <laughs> smile, extrovert. He mm -hmm. could stand on a on a podium and give a speech and guys would be ready to run through the wall. The other guy, a long distance runner, thin guy, total introvert, quiet, almost couldn't. I mean, I'm deaf. I couldn't hear him. Yeah, you know, what, what, what? I mean, just quiet. 
but knew who he was, understood himself, worked in small groups, but he was genuine. He was authentic. When he asked you, how are you doing? You really believed he wanted to hear the answer to that question. He was powerful. That guy made a profound difference because he understood himself. He was authentic. He didn't, he didn't stand on a podium and try to fake it in front of, you know, 2000 people. He worked small groups, but when he asked you how you were doing, you thought he really wants to know he cares. He cares about me and his people would have run through the wall for him, just like the other guy. Very different styles, but incredibly both very effective. You uh, got to know who you are and be authentic. I'd imagine getting to that level of self-awareness probably takes some time and maybe even some development because some skills you probably haven't even developed completely. Um, were there any moments in your career where you started to kind of notice some of your methods that really worked for your style? So I certainly matured and changed as I got older. You know, when I was very young, I was wound tighter than Dick's hat band and the world <laughs> was black and white. This is the rule. This is what you do. This is what, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then I had kids and then I had, you know, new challenges and problems. And then I viewed my workers, even those who were subpar is they got a family, they got kids and what's good enough look like. So I, I evolved over time mm -hmm. for me. I've always been a storyteller teller. I mean, that's who I am. Um, look, I'm a dirt poor kid from North Georgia. You know, the only thing I ever debated in high school was which shift I was going to work. The mill was <laughs> a foregone conclusion. The most my dad ever made in the year of his life was $16,200. Uh, as a professional speaker, I've made twice that in 45 minutes. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, only in America, right? Yeah. And, and, but, but I never forgot who I was and where I came from. And I, I just, I never took the rank of the position, the title seriously. Sure. I was the boss. No one ever doubted that. And I, and I, but I never had a problem with connecting with the most junior guys in a, in a visceral way. Um, because I was that kid. I enlisted first. I lived in the barracks and I, I remember what it was like paycheck to paycheck. And, and I just wanted them to, I just always wanted to love, I love soldiers. Probably the greatest gift I ever, I ever received from the army was the ability to look at a kid from any town USA that just was willing to say, Hey, I'll join up, send me. And to love that kid. I, I, I mean, that, that evolved as we went to combat when, you know, in my book, Pale Horse, I talk about, you know, this, I remember doing a speech uh, before a group of parents and family and loved ones before we sent a flight out to go to Afghanistan. And afterwards, a, a father who was a Vietnam veteran walked up to me. He had a blue jean jacket on. He had his hands in his pocket, small guy. And he looked me and his chin was just quivering. He was on the verge of tears. And he said, you, you take care of my son. Man, I never forgot that moment. I mean, that I, I had a that image was burned into my brain of every one of these employees, right? Soldiers, they got a mom and a dad who loves them. And they're from any town USA, and they were willing to say, I'll go and I'll serve. They deserve my best, whatever that is. They deserve the best I can give them. That motivated me. Uh, if, if I could emphasize that, it sounds like one of the action items that we need to put on the list is definitely to love your people. Um, and if you can't love them, you won't, you can't lead them if you don't love them. Yeah. End of discussion. You I can't lead them if you don't love them. You got to genuinely care. I'd say that with that in mind, probably the majority of leadership positions are taken up more by managers rather than leaders, um, unfortunately. And, and obviously you can be both, um, but I, I wish that more people would focus on- well, let, me, let me open that can of worms, okay? So <laughs> my definition of leadership is to inspire human behavior. 
Mm-hmm. All right. So I don't care if you lead a family, you coach a little league soccer team or football team, you lead a family business, a fortune 100 company or a military organization. We're all in the same business, maximize the potential of everyone in the organization. The end result of which is we maximize the potential of the organization itself. Inspire human behavior. So if you buy that, we lead human beings, we manage processes and systems. There's a difference. Good leader does not equal good manager. Good leader is good manager, right? So I I know people who can manage processes and systems all day long. They could not lead a dog across the road with a choke (laughs) chain around its neck, right? They don't Mm -hmm. inspire people. They can, they can manage processes and systems. They may have an Ivy League MBA, but leadership is about inspiring people. Does your leadership inspire behavior or compel behavior? There's a difference. Do people want to perform for you or do they perform for you out of fear? That's very interesting because I think a lot of people definitely they think more of the negative consequences or maybe even achieving some of the positive consequences how sad than, is that yeah yeah um kind of going back to what you were saying like telling the people to live with themselves um, i feel like most people live with themselves but try everything they possibly can to not live with themselves uh, putting themselves in other situations and things like that um <clears throat> so kind of s- switching gears a little bit obviously being in combat, you see a lot of um, difficult things. Uh, and I'm guessing there were a lot of difficult nights. Uh, so how did you keep yourself from maybe going into that dark place and, 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 and kind of keeping your hope alive that even though this or that terrible thing might have happened to this person, you know, um, things might still be okay. All the leading all the living needed me. I mean, there was a mission to do and tomorrow we were going to go do more operations and, and those young men and women didn't want to become a statistic. They needed the best I had to offer. And I was, I was their leader and I had to, I had to rise to the occasion um, because they needed me. Again, I, I, I really, one of the biggest things, and uh, I mean, as you can imagine, I have my own counselor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, those, were, those were weightful moments. I mean, there, there was a lot of pressure of just making the calls. I mean, someone at the end of the day has to say, we're going in. And some of us aren't coming back. We're going to go do this because it has to be done. And I don't know if, unless you own that decision, I don't know that you can truly understand the power or the weight of that. I I used to make a joke. I said, when I was a COO, I had all the answers to my CEO's problems until I was a CEO and those problems were mine. (laughs) It feels different when they're yours and you have to make the call. You own it, um, but but they counted on they. I mean, I had to. They mm-hmm. their lives depended on it. Yeah, and I would guess as well, not just their lives, but lives of other people for whom these men and women had volunteered to step forward and sacrifice um, them and their their families. Mm-hmm. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so in in making those decisions. How do you make it so you don't you don't get bogged down in the decision making process? Rather, you are able to make decisions in a timely fashion, even if they're really, really difficult, and then take action on them. Yeah. So one of the most important questions a leader can ask is when must I make this decision? Um, because making it prematurely can be catastrophic and Um, making it too late has obvious consequences, right? Not making a decision is making a decision. Um, And so knowing when you have to make a decision 
how much information you need to make an informed decision um, is important. And then just, at, at, you know, at the end of the day, accepting that I got to make the best decision I can when I have to make it with the information I have and, and being able to live with, you know, with that. I, I was always okay with that. Uh, you know, I didn't always get it right, but I, I always, you know, ask myself, can I live with this based on what I know? And am I making it for the right reasons? Was there any moment or, or experience where you really learned kind of some crucial pivotal moment where you learned how to make decisions in your experience? Or I, I, don't, I don't know that there is, no. Um, in the military, a lot of responsibility is cast on you very early uh, when you're young, younger than in corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I grew up in that, that, command and control era, you know, the Cold War and the industrial age for the business world, make a decision, take charge, you know, and, and it was about this, take charge, make a decision, be authoritative and all this. And, and, um, but I very quickly realized that, that we is always better than me. Um, that our collective potential is always better than Jimmy Blackman's individual potential. So where I could be more um, collaborative, where I could get a consensus, uh, more input, I tried to because, the, you know, I was the guy who said, I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll openly admit I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm smart enough to surround myself by really smart people. And if I can solicit their input and create an environment where they're willing to throw their ideas on the table, I'll probably come up with better ideas and outcomes than I would in isolation. And so I tried to create those environments. I tried to shape, you know, a culture where people felt empowered to throw their ideas on the table, to be collaborative, and that I was open to it. And, and so I, I feel that made me better. I, I, I probably got better over time at that as I got more senior than when I was young. Um, but I, I don't know of any one, you know, point where the light came on. It was over time seeing that it's okay to be surrounded by people smarter than you. You get credit for what your organization does, what it achieves. Um, it's okay to not have the answer. I, and so that even drove the way I solicited, you know, and gave guidance. If I might have an idea for how we should do something, but if I wasn't completely comfortable with it, I was hesitant to throw my ideas out first because oftentimes my people would give me back what I said versus I want that eureka moment. Like, yes, I did not think of that. Absolutely. That that's it. You know, I didn't want to shut that down. So I would openly tell them, I've got some ideas. I don't want to share those with you, but here's, here's, you know, the situation. Here's what we got to do. I'm totally open. You know, no ceilings, no floors. Give me your ideas. I like that. Um, and I especially like <clears throat> hearing that uh, it wasn't necessarily one moment because hopefully that's uh, encouraging to whoever is out there listening that their leadership journey uh, isn't uh, it's not done and, and, and they can still learn and things like that um, i'm still <laughs> learning today that's for sure exactly and actually kind of uh, a little bit on that note switching gears a little bit not everyone is going to be uh, a leader in the military or even a business manager leader but probably the thing that they're most likely to be is a parent and when you're a parent you lead your family whether you're the husband or the wife. Uh, so, so what lessons of leadership have you learned that have affected how you are as a husband or a father? One size doesn't fit all. <laughs> They're all different. They're individuals. And, and that's, that's the case with military leadership, business leadership, parenting. Every one of those kids are different and you need to understand how to motivate whom. Um, you know, there's everybody out there in your organization. There's there's that person that all you have to do is look at them and say, 
appreciate what you do. It makes a difference in this company. And that's enough for them, right? There's that other person. You better have your arm around them. You better be patting them on the back to, man, we're proud to have you. You make a difference in this company and they go perform for you, right? Mm -hmm. We need to understand that's okay. We're all motivated differently, but we need to understand, you know, all of my kids, I've got four kids, um, 27 to 17, and they're all different. And what works with my 27 year old does not work with my 21 year old. It just doesn't. And, and that's okay. We need to understand that it can't just be, this is who I am. This is my style. They'll figure me out and conform. You'll never be as good as you could be. You may do okay. You can be better if you understand how to motivate home. What moves them individually? Good leaders understand that. That's really fascinating. Um, I, I love talking about parenting, especially from people who have had extensive experience leading people who aren't necessarily children, because uh, depending on the business you're in, sometimes your employees can be worse than children or so forth. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I really like how you said you could form, and you didn't really say it this way, but the way I got it is you, you can form your skills to your people to help them reach the desired goals, uh, not necessarily bending your will to them or things like that. And I thought that was very insightful. Um, as it pertains to business, <clears throat> what lessons have you learned that are maybe more applicable in the business world than they were in the world of the military? Um. You know, the interesting thing is most people assume, our clients assume that in the military, you know, the leader gives the orders and says, this is what we're doing. Everybody salutes the flag and moves out. Yes, sir. Does it? And that's just, that's a farce. That's a Hollywood <laughs> stereotype. That's just crazy. It's just not true. Um, we still have to inspire. We still have to move people. And I, I'll, you know, I'll go back to what we said earlier that they, they won't remember what you said. They'll remember how you made them feel. Um, if you can connect to them on the human level, you can present the case for what we're doing and why it matters in a, in a, in a real way, then people respond again. It's that, Man, we are social creatures and these these relationships, these connections matter. They they move people. We see sports teams that that move people around and maybe they trade a A player for two B players, but the two B players are team players and they and, and they perform incredibly well, right? Mm -hmm. Um Building teams that perform is about that human interaction. It's about that connection. It's about being real, being vulnerable, being human. Mm -hmm. We all want to be led. We all want to be inspired. We all want to be the best version of us that we can be. All of us are not equally talented. We don't all have the same potential, but we all deserve to be the best version of us that we can be. I'm, I'm giving a speech this weekend in Georgia, and uh, and I'll share this because your podcast will be out before I get to say this in my <laughs> speech, but I uh, <clears throat> I went back to my high school. I was a long-distance runner. I made a U.S. World Armed Forces <clears throat> World Team in cross country, and uh, I, I was a, a good runner in high school and junior high, and, and I, I'd been in the Army about 10, 12 years, and I went back to my hometown to, vi to visit my family and my coach would, it was cross country season. It was in the fall. So I said, I'm going to go down to a workout with a cross country team and see coach. My coach was phenomenal. He had won the region meet like 15 years in a row. He's in the Georgia uh, coaches hall of fame. I mean, he was a great, great, he knew distance running. Mm -hmm. So I met with him that day that before the, the, the kids showed up and I said, coach, how's the team this year? And he said, Oh, Jimmy, Got a bunch of great kids. Got big hearts. I got no speed. You can't win without speed. <laughs> and I said, Coach, um, I didn't have a lot of foot speed, but you built strength in me, and I won a lot of races for you on strength. He said, Jimmy, I don't care how hard you train it. You'll never win the Kentucky Derby with a mule. <laughs> 
and we laughed, right? Right, because it's true. Mm -hmm. But the reality of that is, every mule deserves to, to be the best mule it can be. Yeah. Right. We're we're not all going to win the Kentucky Derby. We are what we, we we've got what we got, but getting the most out of everyone matters. So I ask business leaders today, if they're on your payroll, they're important, right? If they're not, get them off. <laughs> but if they're on your payroll, they're important. The question is, are you getting the most out of everyone on your payroll? Are you inspiring them to be the best version of themselves they can be? If you're not, then you're falling short. You can do better. Is it them or is it you? Could be either one, but do you know? I love that. Um, and that's that's the goal of the whole Hard Thing podcast, to help people become the best they are. I, in my case, it's probably the best mule I can be, but uh, <laughs> um, definitely getting people to be the best. And and I think you've done a wonderful job in inspiring people. You've, you've inspired me. So for, for nothing else, thank you so much for coming on the show, talking with me and, and sharing your story. Thanks I, for I, having I, me. I really appreciate it. Before we let you go, though, we do got to ask, how can people reach out to you, Jimmy? How can they connect with you, engage with you, and see what you're up to? Well, I have to live on social media. So <laughs> if you Google Jimmy Blackman, and that's Bill, A-C-K-M-O-N, not A-N, um, you'll get it. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, everything. And then JimmyFBlackman.com. Um, and then of course, you know, all my, my books are out there. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a presence on social media, I guess, to a degree. Perfect. I will link to all those in the show notes, but as well, we need to give our audience some action items to do. So here's the list that I came up with and Feel free and add to this uh, at the end. So number one is to picture that guy to make yourself keep going. Uh, number two is to know who you are and live with yourself. And number three is to make sure you love your people. Do you want to add to that list at all? Um, I, no, I think those are good. It, it's, uh, you know, it. I think all of us want to be the best version at heart that we can be. The question is, are we willing to do the things necessary to do it? That's part of my talk this weekend as well as um, it, it doesn't come free. It requires effort, you know, to be the best version of us that we can be uh, requires some sacrifice. It requires that you, you prioritize, that you try to invest in yourself in a meaningful way. I, I, I look around me at consultants that we hire in our firm that are 30 years old and have less experience than me. And I go, man, they do that well. I wish I did that that well. <laughs> what could I do to do that as good as them? You know, what do I need to do? So it, it requires action. It requires commitment. Um, and so I would encourage folks to, you know, if, if, if you see those things that, that, you admire and others ask yourself, how can I do that that good? How could others admire that in me? What do I need to do? And then you just got to commit. Excellent. I will get all of that up in the show notes. And thank you so much again for, for coming on the show. Uh, if nothing else, inspiring me, but I, I have a hunch that you're going to inspire a whole lot more, whoever listens to this. Uh, but thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, there you guys have it. What an amazing show. Uh, if you're not inspired, I would challenge you to go back and listen to the show again because you probably weren't listening. Uh, chatting with Jimmy was awesome. He's a great guy. And I would just highly encourage you guys to go out and get his new book, Ranger School, Discipline, Direction, and Determination. Uh, you guys can pre-order it now, so go on to his website, jimmyfblackman.com. Uh, and that's Blackman, B-L-A-C-K-M-O-N.com. Uh, but seriously, go engage with him, reach out to him on all the socials, tell him thank you for coming on the Hard Thing Podcast. Uh, I, I know he would appreciate that. And as far as appreciation goes, I just want to thank you guys for listening to the show. Thank you guys for coming back every week, and uh, hopefully you're doing the action items and, and changing your life. But thank you guys for, for all the support you've given us. So come back next week. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can on Instagram at the Hard Thing Podcast. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the shows and maybe uh, feature you if you uh, have a hard thing you've done. Uh, go ahead and uh, make sure you guys go ahead and do some hard things because as always, you will overcome average. <laughs> <laughs>